Hi everyone. Today's session we're going to focus on structure analysis in language in this case. So we're looking at the AQA language paper one, section A, question three. However, the skills and uh, ideas we go through in this particular session can, can apply to any form of structural analysis within English. Um, it's all about making connections between paragraphs, making connections between whole text that you're given, but also whole literature text and text and how things develop from the beginning, middle and end, which is going to be our focus today. Now we can have a look, uh, we're going to be using the same example as we used in our question four video. You'll notice potentially slightly different uh, background on this particular PowerPoint. Uh, that's because this is more of a skills based session uh, tweaked towards question three for paper one. So we're using the extract again from Brighton Rock, uh, and we're going to be focusing on that. Um, if you Google Brighton Rock Hail Extract AQA English Language, you should be able to get the extract. Um, I'm working on a shared so, uh, folder to put all resources for sessions in. Uh, as soon as that's available, I'll be I'll make a either a video update or I'll put a link to it in all the descriptions for the videos. So let's get started. So what I would like you to do to begin with is I want you to consider how does this extract show the development of Hale's character? So literally, this is the beginning of the extract. In just the first three paragraphs, how do we get a development of character? If you'd like to pause the video now, make a couple of notes, and we'll, and we'll continue from there and we'll feed back in just a second. So if you pause the video now and have a go. Okay, so how is the character of Hale shown to develop across this extract? How does he begin? How does he change? And I want you to focus on his feelings and attitudes. So just before we do that, this is indeed the mark scheme for language paper one. It is out of eight marks, not 12. That's a slight mistake. Um, however, the descriptors are still exactly the same. Let's get perceptive understanding. You need to use a range of judicious quotations, which are the best quotations possible. You need to analyze the effects of the writer's choice of structure. So you need to, first of all, show an understanding that you understand why the writer has used such structure elements. So the beginning, middle and end narrative structure that we'll go through in a moment. And to get this perceptive understanding, which is where we are all aiming for, we should all be aiming for, um, you need to be able to, so, to say what the effect of that is on a reader. However, in terms of understanding, range of relevant quotations, judicious quotations is, first of all, you find a range of relevant quotations and then you pick the best ones, the ones that really clearly show what you're trying to say and those that um, are impactful and really good examples, have a lot to talk about in them. Okay? And obviously subject terminology is always very, very important for the language paper. Um, subject terminology in this case will be things like narrative structure, uh, your different sentence types, things we'll go through in a second. Okay, so if we have a look at this then, how does this link to a typical narrative structure? Now, really quick overview if you're unsure of what the narrative structure is. Exposition is the very beginning of the text. The very beginning of the text establishes character, establishes setting. Um, you will usually find in a novel situation, you'll normally find this at the very beginning of the novel, the first couple of chapters uh, that tell you a little bit about the characters a little bit where, uh, about where it's set and it basically establishes what to expect. It establishes where it is, who's involved. And as we continue up to, into the rising action, this is where things start happening. So in a novel, the protagonist might go somewhere new or experience a problem. And the rising action, the fact that action is rising, as it says, suggests things are picking up pace, things are starting potentially to go wrong, or things are getting exciting, um, up until the climax. Now the climax is the crisis also point, is the moment when the action hits its highest point. So there is no going back from this. So situation develops and develops and de develops up until this climax crisis point where nothing else can happen. Nothing else is going to happen in terms of development, we've hit the peak. And then the falling action is the problem resolving itself or being resolved, uh, whether that's positively or negatively. Uh, in an extract or a novel, it's the 
solving. It's the development. It's the it's the development of the the resolution. And then denouement is again the calming down. Uh, everything sorting itself out, or we've come to a resolution of a problem, um, and that's usually the ending of a text or an extract. So if we have a quick look here in this particular extract here, um, we can argue that we have an exposition because we get because we can see that we're introduced to the character of Hale. So this is the very beginning of the extract, your Brighton Rock extract that you will have, hopefully. Um, we're introduced to Hale. And again, we get the setting that he's been in Brighton three hours. Uh, and we learn that they meant to murder him. Now, deliberate ambiguity at the beginning, they keeps it ambiguous um, and begins straight away to build some form of tension. Now, we learn that Hale has inky fingers and bitten nails. We can suggest, or it can be suggested, that this is a direct result of the fact that he has the knowledge of people meant to murder him. The fact that his manner was cynical and nervous is the fact that, again, linking into his knowledge of murder. And anybody could tell that he didn't belong in that particular area amongst the holiday crowd. So, again, that is... Specific, that is significant in the fact that he didn't fit in, therefore he would feel potentially more vulnerable and whatnot. So this whole ex so this whole extract is our exposition, but straight away we get a lot of information in the first little paragraph, and that's important. The writer has done that deliberately, and that's something I want you to think about. Why has the writer given us all this information in just three lines? What is the effect of this? And as we continue through, so a train came in Victoria every five minutes, so the crowd potentially is growing um, minute on minute. Um, and again, we get a little bit of a contrast to the fact that the sort of the darkness and murder and the inky fingers and bitten nails, so the nervousness, the untidiness, the fact that the air was fresh and glittering, uh, the silver paint sparkled on the piers, the fact that it was new silver paint. Um, again, we have this idea of flower flower gardens in bloom at the pale vanishing clouds across the sky everything's calm everything's bright and wonderful it's like an idyllic dreamlike state dreamlike area and again we have that contrast between Hale's feelings and the setting again why has the writer done this what is the significance of this what effect does the writer want to achieve by doing this and then in the final paragraph of the introduction in, of the exposition uh, Hale was giving himself up to the good day, drinking gin and tonics whenever his program allowed. So program implies he's there for a particular reason. He's there for a job. And the fact that he gave himself up to the good day implies that potentially he's either becoming distracted away from the idea that people want to murder him or he is just beginning to relax um, and feel that element of safety. Now, what, you, what we need to think about as an... Um, as part of our analysis is what is the effect of this on the reader? What is the effect in building the character in the setting and using contrast in this way? So when we are looking at particular texts, when we are analyzing for question three, especially, we need to think of the beginning, as I've said before, the middle and the end. Now, literally for question three on paper one, um, language paper one, you only need to write three paragraphs. How does what does the writer focus our attention on at the beginning? What is the effect of that? How does this develop into the middle? Again, I am one for checklists. I like to checklist everything uh, to make sure you've got a step by step. You've got the key criteria that you need to include in your responses. And then how does it end and why? So how does the text end, the extract end? And why does it end that way? How does it develop in the middle? Why does it develop in such a way? Track a central metaphor or idea. Now, it's fairly obvious that in the text we're going to be looking at, we're tracking an idea and not necessarily a metaphor. We're tracking the idea of Hale's nerves and we're tracking a character and their development. And then we also can consider how structural features are used in order to achieve these effects. So things like different types of sentences, line lengths, punctuations. Where are these elements used in the text and what effects they create? which brings me on nicely to the idea of this narrative structure. Now, please excuse my spider, spider crawl on this slide, uh, spider scroll even on this slide. Um, we've got the types of sentences up here. So where would you expect to find each type of sentence in a narrative structure? Well, 
I've given you a little bit of an idea here. In the exposition, where we're explaining things and giving details, you're most likely to find multi-clausal and complex sentences for the simple fact information needs to be given. And necess in, it's, in most cases, it's necessary to give lots of detail to really, really set the scene. And as things begin to go wrong or begin to pick up excitement, sentences will become shorter. Now, if we relate this to ourselves, when we become nervous, panicked, excited, we speak quicker. We do things a lot quicker. When we panic, we do things a lot quicker. And that is significant in the fact that writers are going to try and emulate that feeling in their actual writing in the way that they structure it. So arguably, shorter sentences build pace in a text and therefore might reflect the feelings of the characters involved. So in our text, as we go through, if you see that the texts are beginning to shorten at a certain point, sorry, the lines, the sentences begin to shorten at a certain point, identify which part of the narrative structure that falls into. Is it the climax? Is it um, the crisis point? Have they reached the crisis point of the problem and their emotions are at the highest point? If that's the case, then the writer has used short sentences to convey a sense of panic, um, or it might be positively, it might be excitement um, in the character to convey that to the reader through structural choices. And then again, does the text, uh, do the sentences in the text begin to lengthen again as things begin to sort themselves out and we get explanations and the character has time to breathe and consider things? Might be that complex multiclausal sentences are used to introduce that idea, the fact that everything's calmed down and the character is able to think clearly. Okay, and you may wish to do this on a text. I highly recommend when you enter an exam, when you do mock questions, uh, whatever, this paper is yours. The extract is yours to annotate. And annotations can be drawing diagrams. So I personally, especially in the language exam, would draw the narrative structure. And remember exposition, rise in action, climax, falling action, denouement. I would remember that and draw a little diagram at the top of your page and actually use the inverted pyramid, or it might be a standard pyramid, or it might be an hourglass, depending on how the sentences are structured and where they fall in the text. I would actually draw a line drawing of an inverted pyramid, standard pyramid, or an hourglass type shape to indicate to you visually as part of a plan for this question, where are the sentences changing? Where is the writer deliberately changing the structure? In most cases, this will be the case. Um, and find where the sentences are changing and then figure out in terms of the narrative, in terms of what's actually being written and expressed in the text, why is that being used? Why are those particular sentences being used at that point? What are they being used to convey and present? And that's where a lot of marks are going to come from. So not only in terms of your beginning, middle and end, but I want you to focus on how a range of evidence and how a range of devices are used to achieve this. Okay, so we are going to have a look at the extract from Brighton Rock and use your analysis skills that we've just picked up. Uh, feel free to pause, rewind the video um, as and when you're annotating this, especially the few slides in where you have all the different things to look out for on one slide. I personally would go back there, pause it and annotate your text. Um, how has the writer structured the text to interest you as a reader? Again, paper one, section A for AQA, question three. This question won't, 99.8% 99, 99 sure that it won't ever change uh, because it's been consistent for the past, for since the exams began, uh, since the series of exams began. So we can say with a certain degree of certainty that the question won't change. You will be asked to look at a structure of a text. You'll be asked to consider the whole text and how it's been structured to engage you, interest you as a reader. And that is how things develop. How has the writer structured the text to develop their ideas, a character's journey, an emotional journey, a physical journey, whatever it is. And again, the trigger words in the, in the question, you will either be asked in most English exams, how or explore. And that basically means that you develop your interpretations, you say, how ideas are presented and why they are presented in such ways, linking back to our what, how, why structure um, that is prominent on our channel, on the MidTech Team English MidTech uh, YouTube channel. So this is 
the text as much as possible. In fact, this is the full text. This is a full extract from Brighton Rock on one page. Again, if you wish to take a screenshot of this and annotate it, or a again, if you manage to find a digital version, please do annotate it. But what I would like you to do is, first of all, I want you to establish where the beginning, middle, and end are of this extract. Now, we can say that we have already done this. Well, we've already established where the beginning is. We've said the beginning is here because in our opening activity, we had a look at the beginning and how things change and develop. So we can say that is indeed our beginning. Now where, and we can argue that the middle starts here, but where does that middle end? Where does the end begin, if you like? Uh, what, I would, what I would like you to do now is I'd like you to take a few moments, pause the video again, um, rewind back, Pause on what you've been asked to, uh, the features you've been asked to identify. Use the checklist to help you. And where is the beginning? Where is the middle? Where is the end? And what happens at each? Does it follow our narrative structure? Are we at the exposition in the first, in the beginning of the extract? Does it develop into a rising action? Do we get to a climax? Or do we get a rising action and climax and then does it fall straight away? You make that distinction. So pause the video, take a few minutes just to make some annotations and to have a little bit of a think. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to have a look at that. Uh, please do excuse my spider scroll, but these are the annotations that I made uh, and I had to think about. So we've already said that at the beginning of the text, we established the idea that Hale doesn't want to be found. He's incredibly nervous because his life is being threatened. They meant to murder him. And of course, he's going to be cynical and nervous because he's beginning to panic. He's panicking. His bit nails are a physical representation of that. We can see that the sentences in the beginning are quite the complex sentences. So they are giving us quite a lot of information. However, Hale's nervous feeling, especially in that first paragraph, are being conveyed arguably through the short clauses that are being used. Hale knew, comma, before he had been in Brighton three hours, comma, that they meant to murder him, full stop. Three short consecutive clauses. Yes, that's a complex sentence. However, short clauses are being used to build that pace. So we're getting a description, but we're also getting a little bit of pace being brought in there as well. And again, cha the change here, He's beginning to relax. So we get the idyllic setting where people are enjoying themselves um, and he's panicking in this utopia, this idyllic setting. And we see that this has an effect on Hale here when he begins to give himself up to the day. He's beginning to relax. He's drinking alcohol to calm himself down potentially. And we know that he has a job to do. Let's say stick closely to the program. So we know that he has a job to do. Therefore, he's trying to get, he's obliged to do this job. And again, he's drinking to potentially allow him to do that to calm his nerves. Because contextually, um, people do, people have been known to drink alcohol in order to calm themselves down because that's the effect alcohol has on the body. And in this case, he's in a situation where his life's being threatened. He's trying to relax himself in order to do his job that he's obliged to do. So that's the beginning of the text. In the middle of the text, we learn about his job. And we get more information about why he feel he's feeling nervous and why he feels threatening. So threatened even. So arguably, this is the rising action. Advertised on every messenger poster. So messenger is a newspaper. Collie Kibber in Brighton today. He is Collie Kibber. He is the person who is dressed. We get a little bit more information is down here that Hale's job is to keep doing his duty until the challenger released him. He is dressed as Collie Kibber. Okay, it is his duty to be found. Now the writer introduces this idea to us to make the reader potentially feel a little bit nervous for Hale, because obviously if he needs to be found, it's his job to be found, then how does he know? He's in a crowd full of people. How does he know who, who means to murder him and who's there to claim the prize? Potentially he doesn't until obviously it actually happens. And again, the fact that big prize is attached to this means that he knows that people are wanting to, to find him but he can't distinguish who it is. And he has to make himself available, make himself open to this. And again, we get the development. We get a little bit of a development of a key image here. The fact he drink his, drank even his gin and tonic hastily from the fact he was drinking gin and tonics whenever his program allowed. The fact now he's drinking them hastily builds that panic again, builds that feeling of panic again. Um, and again, implies that we are potentially getting to this rising action, this climax. Um, 
And again, he's drinking hastily, he's drinking quickly because he wants the effects of the alcohol to embed themselves on him and make him feel feel calmer. The fact that as the fact that he wore the same kind of hat in the photograph, uh, and the fact that the messenger printed it always on time shows that again he is a target and it was his duty to be spotted makes him even more of a target and potentially makes him feel even more panicked and we we get a change again into focus he leans against the rail so we get more specific information about what hale is doing and again that's a change from the so we've got them he's drinking his gin and tonic to he leans against a, uh, a, rail, a rail near the palace Pier, which again shows us the change in focus in the paragraph, potentially a change in focus or implies a change in focus in the text. We're beginning to come towards the end of the narrative, the extract even for the narrative. And he showed his face to the crowd. Again, he's making himself a target. He's making himself vulnerable. Um, and that is going to again build up the tension in him, as we can see with lots. Yes, we've got lots again of long, complex sentences, but the, the clauses, especially at the beginning, are quite short. Again, potentially to imply the uh, what Hale is seeing, he's trying to process as quickly as he can do uh, because of this nervousness that he feels. And right at the end, the last cut, the last two and a bit lines when it disappears off the PowerPoint, that's two and a bit lines. Nobody paid attention to Hale. No, no one seemed to be carrying a messenger. He deposited one of his cards carefully on the top of a little basket and moved on with his bitten nails and inky fingers alone. So again, potentially we get a link to the beginning, the fact that nobody paid attention to him and we've got those inky fingers and bitten nails again in the second line of the text and now in the last line of text. So we've got a cyclical nature to this. We've got a cyclical structure, which again, refers back to the beginning to show that Hale's situation hasn't developed any further. If anything, he's now stuck in limbo and he's obliged to do it all again. So again, his situation potentially gets worse and the feelings of nerves and panic again are further developed in him. So we can say that in the beginning of the text, the writer focuses our attention on Hale and his setting and where he is and his initial feelings of being where he is. In the middle, we get some more information. We get some character development. We get some in... in we get some inf more information about Hale, his purpose and his feelings, but also what he is obliged to do. So we get a little bit of rising action because he's approaching a problem. He has to be found. Um, he has to be noticed. He has to put himself out there. And then towards the end, we get a little bit of an anticlimax, actually. Nobody paid attention to him. As a reader, we're expecting um, somebody to come up to him and either claim the prize so Hale can be freed or come up to him and attempt to murder him in the middle of this crowd. Now, if you think about it, in a crowd, potentially no one's going to notice anything. Um, or the other side, a crowd would notice everything. So again, it creates that level of uncertainty, that apprehension uh, for the reader. And we join Hale in his feelings of nervousness and apprehension. So when you write this section, again, if you look at the, que at the question four uh, video also on the channel, and the two or three, I believe, uh, videos that I've done looking at the analysis process, we are using the what, how, why. The purple checklist at the top is something specific. We could actually cut it off around here and just have the first three bullet points. But the first three bullet points are specific to question three in terms of getting you to focus on structure rather than language. But in terms of analysis, the blue checklist can be used in literature, language, history, geography, anything where you're asked to analyze, evaluate, justify your opinion, what, how, why is the structure to use? So when we're looking at structure, the one might say the hedging phrases that I encourage the use of open up a dialogue rather than just saying at the beginning of the text, the writer does this, the writer is definitely doing this. The one might say opens up a critical, critical tone and saying one could say that the writer does this. However, if you want to change your mind later on or look at a slightly different viewpoint you could say however one might also say the writer does this it opens up a much more critical tone to your writing which means you're opening yourself up for more credit um in terms of your written expression so at the beginning of the text the writer focuses the, the reader's attention on the let's use the narrative structure phrasing on the exposition of the novel the writer uses short uh, long uh, sorry more complex sentences with short clauses to establish 
um, Hale's appearance, but also Hale's feelings through that. You put your quotes in, you explain how that shows it, and you say why it's significant to the beginning of the text. Why at the beginning of the text does the writer establish this idea? What is the effect on the reader? Then furthermore, as the text develops into the middle, the writer develops the rising action of the text to whatever you want to say. You put your quote in that shows the rising action. You explain how that shows the rising action. You say why it's significant, uh, but also this is different to the beginning as Hale develops in some way. It's also worth adding, um, please do try, whenever you do any form of analysis, be it structure, uh, language, whether you do evaluation, comparison, please try and embed quotations. Um, use little quotations and other quotations from different parts of your sections to help justify your answers. Again, that is beginning to use judicious evidence choices. Okay. And then finally, as the text draws to an end, the writer does what? Do they build a climax? Do they build an anticlimax in our case? Um, how do they do it? What do they do? How is Hale's journey developing? How does it change at the end? How does it develop at the end? How does it change the reader's experience of the text? These are the types of things you need to consider. So I would love you to have a go at this. Um, hopefully you've managed to find the text, as I say. If not, the text is on the PowerPoint here for you to have a look at, and you can make some notes on paper yourself. If you do have um, any questions or you do produce any um, examples that you would like to be looked at, Obviously, uh, this is being recorded during the uh, lockdown of 2020. So um, access to your particular teachers might not be free and available. However, if you would like to email, uh, not email me, sorry, if you'd like to tweet me, my uh, Twitter handle is in the description below. Uh, please do feel free and I can give you some feedback. Again, obviously, it, it, these are quite busy times, so I might not get back to you as, as soon as you might like, but I will try and get back to you and give you some feedback. Uh, other than that, Please have a go at this. If you find this useful, please do share it with other people. Um, this channel isn't set up for subscribers or likes or whatnot, but if this video is useful to you, please do subscribe and see what else we have to offer going forward. More of these videos will be coming out as and when we do so, as and when they're made. Um, however, please do share this with anybody that is doing um, English, G English language GCSE this year, next year, whenever you view this video, might be a day from publication it might be a year from it might be two years down the line whenever it is but if you have if you have people in the same boat as you please do share this please um get the word out and hopefully this will help as many people as possible with that said um please again keep an eye on the channel for more videos coming forward and i will speak to you next time